Live from Bloomberg's headquarters in New York and streaming on Twitter, I'm Kaylee Lines. And I'm Romain Bostic. Stepping in today for Matt Miller. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, the transactions, and the technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. Coming up on today's show, the ripple effect. Brad Garlinghouse, CEO of the company behind the XRP token, joins us exclusively to discuss his ongoing battle with the SEC. And consumer watchdogs were once held back, but they're now gaining power in the regulation fight. We're going to speak with Kathy Kraninger, the former director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau under President Trump. And catering to the next generation of investors, Fidelity unveils a crypto option for your 401k. That is all ahead on today's program, but first let's get a snapshot of the markets. Your best way to do that on the Bloomberg terminal, CRYP Go. But I pulled a few of the key tokens for you today. No surprise, given the broader risk off sentiment, we are seeing digital currencies under some pressure. Bitcoin down nearly four percentage points. We're back at a 38,000 handle, which is the lowest level going back to mid March. Ether's down nearly four percent as well. Monero's a big underperformer today. It's down more like seven percent. And then, of course, remain, we have to point to XRP. That is the native digital currency currency employed by Ripple. It is down as well, down about 4%, trading right around 65 cents. There is a regulatory overhang here, and we're going to have more on that in just a couple minutes. Yeah, we're going to talk a lot about that. And of course, you mentioned Bitcoin at 38,006 and change here. When we talk about where it's been, it's been nowhere, basically stuck in a trading pattern here for the last few months. And you can see that reflected in the 30-day volatility. That yellow line there, that's the historical average here. And you can see on the far of the screen there where we've been underneath that. A lot of questions right now about volume in this market and more, more importantly the volume of participants in this market. We should also point out though this drop in volatility. Well, maybe that's a sign of more institutional uh, involvement. Maybe that's a sign of a little bit more stability. Maybe it's a sign that crypto, well, it's going a little bit more mainstream. And as it goes mainstream, federal regulators, well, they want to make sure that consumers are getting protections. Rohit Chopra, he's the director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. He spoke on Bloomberg just last month. We're going to be working with the, with the other regulators to figure out how do we make sure that consumers are protected no matter if they're using cash, credit cards, debit cards, or virtual currencies. Meanwhile, Bill Dudley, Bloomberg opinion columnist and former New York Fed president, is warning of the consequences of delaying crypto regulation. Writing in his latest column, quote, the longer officials wait, the greater the risks to consumers, markets, and the economy, and the greater the chances that large losses due to cyber theft or a market crash in crypto assets will force innovation killing crackdown. Joining us now with more is former director of the CFPB, Kathy Kraninger. Kathy was a Trump appointee who resigned in January 2021 at President Biden's request, but she served two years at the agency. She's now VP of Regulatory Affairs at Solidus Labs, which is a crypto risk surveillance firm. Kathy, thank you so much for joining us. That was a pretty dire warning from Bill Dudley about what delaying regulation in this asset class, in this industry could mean. What's taking so long? So Kaylee, thank you for having me. And that is a fantastic question. I think the fundamental issue here though is not uh, rushing to do something that's not gonna stand the test of time and is not going to be good uh, in terms of the evolving technology in this space. So first, let me at least start with the premise that the crypto space is regulated. Uh, it is regulated in one very important way and that's with respect to anti-money laundering concerns and that does uh, introduce as well uh, concerns around market manipulation and fraud. The CFTC does have enforcement authority over that. Uh, certainly the SEC is also uh, looking very closely at this space. Uh, you noted the Ripple case. So yeah. the questions around uh, are there unregistered securities? Uh, again, that brings uh, some of its own protections as well. Uh, but there is more work to be done. Well, uh, well, so Kathy, why, why don't, right. I'm, I'm curious though, Kathy, why don't you think that the CFTC and the SEC for that matter as well have asserted themselves a little bit more based on the existing regulations out there rather than this sort of opaque, uh, I guess, push to create something completely new from scratch? So they absolutely are using existing regulations uh, and seeking to expand them. Uh, the SEC in fact has taken a number of steps uh, in recent weeks, uh, looking at the definition of an ATS, uh, looking at the definition of broker dealers. So there are some, um, at least regulatory actions the SEC is taking uh, to spread into this space. I, I, I'll also note, obviously there are challenges to that, uh, but at the same time, uh, they are not sitting back um, in terms of what their authorities are 
and asserting that existing regulations do, right. in fact, apply but, in this but, but a lot of investors out there, they're waiting for, I guess, that grand plan to be revealed. And I'm wondering if maybe uh, that's misguided on, on the parts of some of those investors. Well, I think when you're talking about institutions, they have a different risk profile and, and fiduciary duties and responsibilities. And I think they're looking for much clearer rules uh, before they can get into this space. And, and that's that's fair. Uh, that's that's something that the regulators can't answer and that Congress would have to act on. Uh, and so um, I'm at a conference now where we're talking about the lack of supervision in spot markets. Uh, while you have enforcement authority by the CFTC, uh, really, uh, there is definitely, uh, I think, a call for supervision in this space. The question, though, of which regulator can perform that role is one Congress is the only one that can answer. Uh, yeah. So in the meantime, yeah, in the meantime, you have enforcement authorities that that will keep pushing this. Well, Kathy, another really interesting thing that's happening is you're seeing a lot of former regulators such as yourself journeying from Washington to a lot of these digital asset firms. What does that tell us about this industry and where it is kind of in its life cycle? It's a sign of maturity. Uh, it absolutely is. You started out with technologists who were excited to build uh, the future infrastructure for finance, for the internet, and understanding that there are regulatory requirements for investor protection, uh, for securities and commodities, that really bringing experts in from financial services, from financial regulation, really helps build and develop okay. this space and mature it. Uh, so it's a positive sign uh, from my standpoint. And I think the other thing is really making sure the industry leads and yeah. helps and educates regulators on what the right standards are for this market. It's also an important role many of us are performing. Well, and obviously you were brought in by Solidus and one of your initiatives over there founded the Crypto Market Integrity Coalition. Can you just tell us more about that, what the mission is and how you think you can bring more integrity into this market? Uh, exactly right. It's a great example of what industry is doing to help, again, establish best practices, establish training programs and regimes, uh, establish the parameters of what truly is manipulation in this space and what's arbitrage and speculation. So the, the dynamics around um, uh, regulatory requirements really do need more conversation. And that's what the Crypto Market Integrity Coalition is about. It's about industry coming together, unified voice, focused on market integrity, and really, uh, frankly, educating the, the marketplace, the public, regulators on what, in fact, we are putting into place. This is an industry that cares about its users and yeah. investors and that wants to see growth, and that's how you do it. Uh, how unified, though, is the industry in that messaging right now, Kathy? I mean, we talk, if we lined up sort of 10 different uh, crypto-related CEOs or CIOs, uh, they would give you 10 different opinions about what they want out of regulation. Certainly at the detail level, and, and that's healthy. Uh, you started out the top by asking, you know, what's it going to take? Really, it's about building consensus over time, having the debate, uh, building uh, a law, frankly, by Congress acting, that's going to be more um, holistic and address the issues. And that comes with this discussion. So I think that the fact of the matter is that you have a unified voice when it comes to the need for market integrity, the requirement to protect users and investors, to be transparent and, and meet the promise of blockchain technology. And that's really where um, CIVIC comes into play. That's where I see the industry. It, it has come a long way. Uh, again, those early technologists are really taking um, the, the lead from the financial services, uh, those with experience in this space to, to bring uh, much more mature regulation to this space. All right, Kathy Craninger, talking of a unified voice, thank you for bringing your voice uh, to our program today. She, of course, is VP of Regulatory Affairs at Solidus Labs and former director of the CFPB. Now, coming up, what is a cryptocurrency? A security or a commodity? We're, We're going to discuss regulation a little bit more, hopefully get the answer from Brad Garlinghouse, yeah. CEO at Ripple, the company behind the XRP token. And remember Anthony Scaramucci? I oh, think yeah, he's down in the guy. Bahamas. I don't know why we're not down in the Bahamas, but he's making a big pivot here. We're going to discuss why the former Trump advisor plans to turn his investment firm toward digital assets. And of course, to access all of the latest data on and news on crypto, check out CRYP Go on the Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg.
The thing with cryptocurrency is people debate, is it money or not? It might be a flight to safety or a hedge against inflation. If Bitcoin is money, what does that say about the definition of money? Bitcoin enables the internet of money. A digital store of value. Digital gold. Really, it's a digital gold. There's moneyness, uh, there's some characteristics of money. The narratives that people have been saying for many years, which is that Bitcoin is kind of this anti-correlated asset or, or uncorrelated asset to um, traditional equity. On a day that is very unexpected, the correlation go, will go from 70% correlated to risk assets to 0%. The valuations are uh, sort of out of kilter with the fundamental value and sort of driven, sort of kept afloat by speculation. It's not an investment. It is an asset. All right. Well, one of the biggest uh, legal questions out there facing the industry is really, what's the definition of a cryptocurrency? Is it a security? Is it a commodity? Bloomberg, Shanali Bassett, you've been following the most important case pending mm -hmm. to try to determine the answer Yeah, to this if question. you take a look, Romain, yeah. it's SEC versus Ripple. And regulators everywhere, Romain, are trying to set boundaries for digital assets. First, that requires defining them. So let's take it back to December 2020 when SEC sued Ripple, along with co-founder Christian Larson and CEO Bradley Garlinghouse. The lawsuit alleges that the payment company XRP's cryptocurrency should have been registered as a security because it was sold when tokens qualify as investment contracts. But Ripple argues that XRP is a commodity and thus beyond that agency's remit. The case is being watched closely because it strikes at some of the key jurisdictional fights that have dogged regulators. While the SEC has jurisdiction over securities, the CFTC regulates the derivatives market, which has prompted a debate about which agency should take the lead in policing crypto overall. The SEC's assertion, if it holds up in court, will bolster the agency in its battle for primacy in crypto regulation. And a victory for Ripple would play into the hands of the CFTC. Gary Gensler, who took over the SEC after the suit was filed, says his agency and the CFTC should collaborate on oversight. And in any case, the final verdict, which is expected later this year, could impact dozens of other digital tokens. It has broad ripple effects, some might say, Shanali. Thank you so much for that great setup, oh, honey. Nice. I know. Now joining us is Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse for an exclusive interview. Brad, it's great to get to speak with you. One of my favorite parts about doing this show in particular is the audience is really engaged, and they always are tweeting things at us during the show, after the show. And a consistent question we get is, when are you going to talk about Ripple and the SEC. So I'm glad we are finally getting to do so. Can you just give us the latest on where you stand in this case? Absolutely. Well, again, thank you for having me. I think it is uh, as you introduced. And the reason why the Twitter crypto community cares so much about this question is it's not just about Ripple. It really is, as was introduced, that the whole industry is impacted by this decision. And the core question, as was kind of set up at the beginning, is boils down to a 1946 Supreme Court case that has become known as the Howey test, a test to determine is something a security or not. And look, at the end of the day, we have other parts of even the United States government who have called XRP the digital asset that's native to Ripple's technology stack. It's been called a currency. It's been called property. Mm. The irony is the only country on the planet that thinks XRP is a security is the United States, is the United States SEC. The case has gone well. Yeah. It's still uh, playing out. You know, the, the SEC, in our judgment, has certainly moved slowly. T typically in these situations, when the SEC brings the case, they want to move quickly. They have been dragging their feet. Uh, you know, Gary Gensler said recently publicly that justice delayed is justice denied. And unfortunately, uh, justice is being delayed here by continued uh, efforts by the SEC to push things out. Okay. Well, Brad, our litigation analysts here at Bloomberg Intelligence think that the SEC ultimately is going to win this. That's just an opinion. It's a hypothetical scenario. But in that scenario, how does Ripple move forward? Well, look, I think the Howey test is uh, being stretched beyond recognition. And again, there's a 1946 Supreme Court case. So the idea that XRP, which we use as a currency, the idea that that's a security, I think is you know just misguided. But Look, it, unfortunately, Ripple is already op operating in a world where it's as if we have lost, right? So in the United States, XRP has all, for all intents and purposes, there's no liquidity. It's been halted and frozen on most U.S.-based exchanges. Despite that fact, Ripple had a record year last year. Uh, we continued to grow very quickly across our major product groups. Even Q1 was a record for us. Now, unfortunately, that growth is almost all coming from outside the United States, 
and we are hiring more and more people outside the United States, but our customer base now is about 95% non-U.S. companies, non-U.S. payment companies. And what's generally, what are you seeing out of those customers with regards to uh, the use uh, of, the, uh, of the crypto assets, Brad? Look, the, the demand for our core product, which uses XRP to facilitate these cross-border payments, the demand for that grew 8x year over year. So from Q1 last year to Q1 this year, it grew 8x. And that's off a base already measured in the billions. Mm -hmm. So from our point of view, demand has skyrocketed. I just think it's incredibly frustrating that well, you know, here in the United States, where we have led innovation in so many different industries, yeah. we have an agency that is overreaching and really constraining well, competitiveness and, and, and hiring of people here in the United States. Yeah, and we kind of know how this uh, plays out, Brad. I worked in Washington for a lot of years with some of these agencies. I, I'm going to rephrase the question I asked before because it seems like what the SEC is going after, and for that matter, the CFTC, is a look at the use case. And I guess how they determine, at least in their viewpoint, the use case for crypto assets ends up becoming, I guess, the base case for what type of regulation you end up with. I think that's super fair. I, I look. I think the different use cases, and one of the things I have certainly pushed from you know the earliest days of my tenure here at Ripple is, it's all about utility. And there's going to be different shapes and different sizes. We're going to live in what I describe as a multi-chain, multi-crypto world. There isn't going to be one winner to rule them all. And I think you know, the way the SEC here in the U.S. at least has acted is, hey, we'll comment on Bitcoin, but we won't even comment anymore about Ether, despite previously leadership of the SEC saying that Ether is not a security. So I, I, I believe very much utility does matter. The facts and circumstances matter. But time and time again, what we find is the CFTC is the most appropriate regulator for this industry. And I think you find that uniformly across the whole industry. So, Brad, you talk about how the U.S., this is kind of a U.S.-specific issue in many senses. How do you see that being formative for the crypto industry here in the States? How far behind does America risk becoming? Well, I think one of the key measures here is if you were starting a crypto or blockchain company today, whatever use case you might be, whatever utility you might be pursuing, would you start it here in the United States where you don't have clear regulation? Or would you choose a jurisdiction like Switzerland or the United Kingdom or Singapore or even UAE? Would you choose a country where you do have clear laws? The advice I give entrepreneurs and even the advice I give investors is if you're starting a company today, start it where you have that certainty and clarity so you can build knowing where the guardrails are. Here in the United States, you know, we simply don't have that. We've been asking for that. You know, one of the great ironies of this whole story here in the U.S. is the SEC at its core has been a group that demands transparency, demands disclosure. Yet they, in this case, are doing the exact opposite. They're hiding their notes. The judge in the case has demanded that they turn over notes to us. They've been resisting that for over a year. So in a world where the SEC is all about disclosures and transparency, they're doing the opposite here. They're claiming that, the, that this is the wild, wild west. Crypto is not the wild west here in the United States. These are regulated entities. It's just they want to be the regulator, and they're thinking more about the, what's you know, kind of in the empire building of the SEC as opposed to how do we make the U.S. super competitive to lead in this industry as we did in the age of the Internet back in the late 90s. All right, Brad, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, great to get your insights. Brad Garlinghouse there, the CEO over at Ripple. Coming up, we promised it, how Anthony Scaramucci plans to triple SkyBridge's assets using crypto. We'll discuss coming up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Crypto. I'm Kaylee Lines with Romaine Bostic. Matt Miller is off today. Now to some crypto stories that caught our eye this week. Fidelity is bringing crypto to its workplace retirement plans. The firm will have a product ready in coming months to allow 401k plan participants to direct a portion of their savings into Bitcoin. Employers will choose what percentage of an employee's account can be directed into crypto, up to a cap of 20%. And two former Jefferies executives have formed Crossover Markets. It's a crypto exchange for institutional investors. They teamed up with the former chief technology officer at Euronext FX to found the company, the trio. They're in the process of closing a seed round of funding and plan to debut the exchange later this year. 
And Anthony Scaramucci plans to pivot his Skybridge capital towards digital assets after years of focusing on high profile hedge funds. Scaramucci expects the crypto focus could help triple assets to $10 billion with digital assets representing the majority of those funds. Shanali Basak is black with us, back with us because she spoke to the man, the mooch himself. What color did he give you behind his thinking here? Yeah, it's interesting because we knew that this was happening for a while, just not how much. And almost half of Skybridge's assets now are in cryptocurrencies buying Bitcoin over at 18,500. So they've done quite well. As we know, Skybridge was known for their SALT conference and the hedge funds that they invest in, guys. And the thing is, hedge funds haven't done all that well hmm. lately. So the Bitcoins have actually been a hedge almost to poor performance elsewhere. It has been, but this is also now becoming a much more competitive space than yeah. what it was yeah. just a couple of years ago. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the question here. We, there are other assets he's been investing in, Ethereum, Algorand. Let's see how far that goes. He's raising new funds. Are, is he going to be able to convince his institutional investors that he's worked with so long that these are the assets of the future? Jury's out. Right, but what we do know is that there are 2,000 people in the Bahamas right now. In the Bahamas. In the Bahamas right now with Anthony Scaramucci, his team yeah. at Salt, and also in conjunction with FTX. We yeah. should have done the show from the Bahamas. I know. We got to take it on the road next year. Would've Talk to Sam Bankman Fried yeah. about that. Would have loved that. Crypto on vacation, That's kind on, of. On the ground, working. shoe leather reporting. <laughs> <laughs> but to that point, when we talk about digital assets that Scaramucci is getting into, we often just go, oh, cryptocurrencies yeah. themselves. Are we talking NFTs and the like here also? Yeah, we certainly are talking about things that are crypto or Bitcoin adjacent, let's call it. Yeah. Remember, we know that there are the Bitcoin maximalists who believe Bitcoin and nothing else, but he's definitely not taken that approach. So the question is, how much can he expand into different assets? There's also one thing, as far as asset classes go, remember, Anthony Scaramucci has invested heavily when it comes to pack money into crypto. Mm. So Skybridge is going to be a force along with Sam Bankman-Fried and many others when it comes to changing regulation as we know it. Yep, because of course we know he had a relatively short history in Washington as well. Thank you so much to Bloomberg Shanali Vostok. It was a great interview. Now coming up next week, we'll have more great interviews. Adam Back, CEO of Blockstream and investor Harry A of the Quantum Fintech Group can will be joining us. Yeah, Maybe uh, Romaine. We'll yeah. see if you can get an invite since your invite to the Bahamas didn't seem to come this year. This Thank you so much for joining us. This Bloomberg Crypto, 1 p.m. Eastern, Tuesdays, yeah. right here on Bloomberg.